everybody. Welcome Morning. to Adobe Live. I'm Erica Larson. I'm here with the very talented Ryan Hamrick. Hey, guys. Um, and today we're talking about drawing and painting in Photoshop. So we're going to do some really cool stuff with some lettering today. Mm -hmm. um, say hello in the chat. We have Judy, Lindsay, Greg, Pamela from Costa Rica. That's Awesome. Thank you all for coming to see us this morning. Um, Ryan and I will be here today and tomorrow, and I think Ryan's hosting later today as well. I am, yeah. Um, and we have lots of other good stuff planned for this week. So if we look at the schedule, um, today we have, we'll be here tomorrow as well, and then uh, more drawing in uh, Adobe XD Daily Creative Challenge with Sam Anderson. Um, <laughs> and then at noon, we'll have Adobe Live Design Systems with Hannah. And we'll also be doing the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge every morning this week. Cool. So definitely tune in for that and brush up on your Photoshop skills. We can all use it. Yeah. I think. I, <laughs> I've been working in Photoshop for, I think, 10, 15 years, yeah. and I still learn things. Oh, yeah. Um, Hesus is an excellent instructor. Nice. So later today, we'll also have a chat and win. That'll happen in about half an hour. Oh, and um, all you have to do is log into behance.net slash live and participate in the chat, ask Ryan all kinds of questions about his work um, and his career, and then you'll be eligible to win 100 three by three stickers from Sticker Mule. Whoa. It's an awesome prize. You could sticker so many things. Yeah. I feel like I could use a few more stickers on my, on my MacBook here. Both of us. Yeah, you, you got a, a modest start going, but yeah, you need some more stickers, I think. Yeah. So whoever wins, you gotta like, uh, and yeah, maybe like work on a little bribe or something like, uh, you know, send us some of your stickers for our computers or something. Agreed. So. You can do a trade. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, about 11, we'll be doing some portfolio reviews. It's a great opportunity to have Ryan see some of your work and give feedback. Um, and with that, Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself sure. and your work, and we'll take a look at your portfolio. Cool. Thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, I'm Ryan Hamrick. Um, I am a letter artist and designer based out of Austin, Texas um, for the last five years or so. Um, and I do primarily uh, letter focused work for advertising, branding, um, actually just uh, founded a, a new studio that we're just kind of uh, kicking off slowly but surely, um, that it's kind of a, a premium, uh, as I'm calling it, a letter direction and brand design studio. So a mm. um, lot, of, lot of branding and logo types and, and things like that. And then also just any other letter-based design needs anyone might have from advertising to you know product design packaging whatever the case may be cool. so um been working on kind of getting that launched and uh, and also a big part of of what we are going to be doing is a lot of advocacy stuff so for, uh, for all the people that do kind of like what i do um you know just kind of trying to elevate the the value of that uh, in the industry as far as you know how everybody sees this kind of work and, and how important it is to really strong design, right? Um, it's hard to think of a really great piece of design from, you know, from history that doesn't have letters incorporated in some way, whether mm. that's a, a font or, you know, just the, yeah. the right typesetting of, of something, you know, to fully custom drawn stuff, like more like what I do. Um, it's always there in some way. So I want to try and um, make that a little bit more, um, of a successful pursuit for for everybody, not just me and my, and my studio. So um, that. that's kind of what, what we're what we're about and what we're what we're starting up. And um, and I'm excited to do a little more drawing in Photoshop because you know, like we said, we, we learn new stuff all the time, right? Um, and I've been using it for about as long as you, I think, 10, 15 years, something. And um, and even just this week, you know, diving into to actually physically drawing into Photoshop a lot. Um, I've always been. Uh, historically, a more paper and pencil guy at the start, um, so I do less drawing in general in Photoshop, hmm. but um, in doing it a lot more over the last week, I've learned a ton, found some awesome brushes and stuff that I've really been digging. Um, so I'm excited to kind of play and, and maybe even explore and learn a little bit in front of everybody else too and uh, get some feedback from you guys on, on how you like to work in it as well. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be sweet. I cannot wait for all of that, so excited. And looks like the chat is too. Everyone's giving you a warm welcome, calling you the master of letters already. <laughs> you haven't even done I mean, any it started, work yet. Yeah, my, my job is done here. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> so, okay, I have a question right okay. away. Why do you call it letter-based work? Um, because there's a lot of different things that um, that involve letters that aren't necessarily lettering, right? So, okay. like something like you have on the screen right now 
is a crazy intricate, um, fun to look at piece, but um, it may be less suitable for something like advertising or mm. especially something like branding. It's obviously way too busy for that. Um, but at the same time, for branding, the, the letters of the name of your company, for instance, if you're going to heavily include that in it and not just be icon based, um, then letters are part of that. And the way that those are designed is really important. Um, also font design, um, you know, and things like, you know, just even setting other fonts and type in the proper way for a specific purpose is all of a piece that is that is super important. So um, letter focused work is something that I've decided to <laughs> take like the it. time to, to get really good at. So, um, and I think it's really, really crucial to any good design. I like it. So yeah. it's more like it's your tool, like a means to, to communicate yes. rather than the th one thing that you do. Right, right. Love um, it. Yeah. Because obviously you have the words themselves that are saying the message, mm -hmm. but then how you present those and style them um, adds a whole nother layer of, of meaning and, and message to it. So, right. yeah. So do you want to take a look at what we're going to be working on today? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so I am working on some pieces for a um, an art show that I have planned. Um, the concept for this, this show was a total accident, um, and I owe a lot of the idea to my father-in-law, actually. Mm -hmm. He was visiting um, from, from Indiana last year, I guess it was at this point, last October, um, and I was working on a linoleum um, block print. Cool. And so I was getting the design ready to actually get it under my linoleum and carve it out, and I almost didn't do it backwards, because <laughs> I don't do that very often. So I was like, just going right along, having a great time. And he actually was just like, so doesn't that need to be backwards? And I was like, oh my God, it absolutely does. <laughs> I almost started carving this thing forward and like uh, would have ruined my entire week. Um, <laughs> but it gave me this idea to, uh, he's like, I, I thought maybe you were gonna do it backwards. So like when people take a selfie with it or something, it would be forwards. And I was like, oh snap. Yeah, so I'm doing a series of, of art pieces that are going to be reversed, um, painted on, on canvases, so that when people visit the, the gallery, they take a selfie with it, post it on Instagram. Um, but the extra layer is that they are all uh, cynical commentaries on social media and the internet in general. So, okay. Um, it's a lot, but we're gonna be working on one of those pieces <laughs> today. Uh, and the cool thing about uh, Photoshop is that we can kind of get a really good feel for how that's going to look when it is painted um, mm. by using some of these awesome brushes and stuff in Photoshop. So um, that's what I'm really excited about. I can draw things on paper all day long, but until they start to look real with colors and, and texture and stuff, then it's uh, it's hard to kind of visualize exactly how that's gonna be. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's what we're gonna Great. work on. I love the real world back to, to digital, back to the real world uh, cycle. That's I have always, awesome. um, I kind of got into design a relatively short time ago, um, just a little over eight years. So uh, instead of really getting lost and, and stuck in the ways of the analog necessarily, um, I've always used Photoshop and, and these digital tools to kind of assist um, speeding up the process and stuff. So. Um, and anytime I do anything physical, like a, a painting or something like that, it always starts in <laughs> Photoshop planning and getting the spacing right, um, or else I would end up with a lot of words running off the edges of, of things. So um, that's, that's the way I always, I've always worked. And, um, you know, maybe it's a shortcut or a cheat, but no, I'm fine with it. No, that's, I mean, <laughs> those are billable hours. You're right. Yeah, I gotta, yeah. They got to make the most of that time. Totally. Right? So, yeah. Let's do it. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for welcoming uh, Ryan. Kathleen, it's good to see you in the chat. Hey, Kathleen. Kathleen was my host the first time I was here last year. So what's up, girl? Um, OK, so I've got a Photoshop document up right here. Uh, are we ready to just jump into it? Let's do yeah, it. let's okay. do it. All right. Um, so I've got a conveniently sized uh, Instagram portrait mm -hmm. dimensions um, thing, because obviously, I'm not gonna do these physical pieces and then just not share them online, right? So um, I've got my my nice portrait orientation, uh, 2000 by 2500 canvas here, blank and ready to take some things on. Now, um, I've actually been able to try out the, uh, the new Adobe Fresco app. <gasps> wow. And so on the plane on the way here, I actually 
created a background for it in there. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time in there today, but can we get the feed of my iPad up? Maybe not, I, I think. Well, while we're doing well, that, I don't want to ruin my connection. should we oh. talk a little bit about what Fresco is for those yeah, people sure. who, who don't know? Um, Fresco is okay. an yeah. upcoming drawing and painting app yeah. um, that works beautifully on the iPad. Um, so Ooh. there are things called live brushes, mm -hmm. which have super dynamic qualities that make you feel like you're really painting with oils or watercolors. Um, you can use both pixel and vector brushes in the app, which I bet for you is a huge deal. Absolutely. Um, what there else is. do we love about it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the the fact that everything is here, you've got vector, you've got pixel, and then you've got these, these live ones, which is what mm -hmm. I'm gonna show off just a little bit here. Um, all in the same space. So, and the cool thing is when you when you start using one thing, like the layers on the right side over here, they are um, they're kind of specifically tailored for whatever you're going to be doing on that layer. So if it's a vector layer, it can exist with with pixel based layers and stuff. And it's um it's a really neat way of approaching this kind of of work. And with those live brushes, you get this this paint texture that we're going to see here. That is just insane. Um, I remember I was at Adobe Max three years ago, whichever one Jordan uh, Peel was there. Um, he, they were they were showing off a lot of thing at, at um, sneaks. Mm -hmm. My favorite. <laughs> um, with all this like depth and texture and like 3D ness to all this painting they were doing, um, and that was like super early days of this stuff. But I remember they presented him with like a 3D printed canvas of the painting that somebody did yeah, of a character. Yeah, that was so cool. It was so awesome, but it was all created digitally, which was just wild. Um, and now it's starting to really come to fruition. And with tools like the iPad, it's um, it's a lot more feasible to do this stuff. So, um, all right, we've got my my iPad up on the screen here, and again, I've got this 2,000 by 2,500 pixel. Uh, canvas here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here. I'm going to grab one of these live brushes here. So as I open this guy up, I get some options here. And right now we've got watercolors and oil. And there's a few brushes in each one. And um, what I did to create the background that I'm going to use is I came in here to oil. And I think I grabbed oil paint short because it's got a little bit of a, a natural um, pressure sensitivity for size. So I can kind of do big and small um, sizes for that kind of stuff. And then if I come back out of here, I've got that selected, and I'm gonna create. I'm gonna grab a color that's like a little lighter than black, so you can see some. Yeah, I know. I would go for black <laughs> if I could see some of that detail. But um, I'm just gonna zoom in here a little bit, and I'm gonna start painting with this guy. Oop, let me make that a little bigger, so we can actually see what's happening. Oh, look at that grit. Yeah, a lot of texture in there. And as I start to paint. Ooh. See that texture in there? And as I go the other way, I can get a little bit more over there. Yeah, there we go. It's like it's real. It's so cool. And I can do things a lot better on here than I could on an actual canvas. So when I do actually go to do these in real life, it's gonna be interesting. Let's see if I can <laughs> match my <laughs> digital abilities. But um, so what I did to make this uh, this background that I'll show you the, the finished piece of, I just wanted to kind of create a uh, kind of like a radial gradient almost of paint. So I just came in and literally just did one of these numbers. Got some paint everywhere. And again, this texture is just like hardcore in there. And some of these brushes even, they have like a, like paper texture, like mm -hmm. canvas textures like built into them. Um, and just, you can see you can see that canvas Oof. texture yeah. all up in there. It's so cool. So I started with that, and then I just started kind of uh, doing a little bit of a gradient. I grabbed a little purple, and you can come in here and just grab this little color wheel. And we can start adding in some, some purple into the mix here. I'm just gonna kind of like throw the color down in a few places. So spontaneous, I love it. Yeah. You can double tap, or not double tap, but two finger tap to undo. Everyone's super excited to try Fresco when it's out. Ugh, they you guys love are the gonna name. love it. Yeah, perfect name, right? Yeah. Got, that's what it's all about is this incredible texture. And yeah, all the other tools you could possibly want are in there too, but like this is the, the kicker, man. This is yeah. like, 
and we'll see nice. later. It just works so seamlessly with Photoshop. And if you're used to that ecosystem, then it's gonna the UI is gonna feel super natural Ooh, to me. the way that you've been working. Yes, that's another thing too. Is that uh, you know it's a uh, it's of a piece with everything else, right? So you can kind of have that instant familiarity with uh, a lot of the UI and the the tools and the icons and stuff are are familiar and kind of use the, some of the same language. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent a lot more time on the one that we're going to actually use, but you get the idea here, right? We've got a little color mostly dark and close to black, which is <clears throat> good for my taste. Um, but we've got this awesome textured background. So when I get started on this thing on an actual canvas, this is kind of how I will start by laying down this background layer. Cool. And so now I can really see what that's going to look like under the lettering that I'm going to do on top of it. So that's pretty sweet. Um, I would love to spend all day in there, but I think we can move a little faster if we use actual Photoshop. So I'm going to come back over here. And I've got that connected there. Uh, am I cool to just swap these? Yep. Okay. Pop that guy. So Rachel right asks, how long do you think it'll take before fine art museums start adding digital art sections? Well, I have to imagine that that is happening some. Yeah. At least already, um, if not a lot. I think that um, with how digital printing is coming along, mm -hmm. especially like, um, you know, there's going to be plenty of artists who will refuse to be constrained by their ability to do something physically in analog. Um, if they can create really compelling and beautiful artwork digitally, um, why shouldn't that belong in the museum next to everything yeah. else, right? Even if that means like a, a digital canvas on the wall of a, of a gallery, right, where it's just showing a super high res display of a piece of digital art. I mean. I could see that happening. Um, I'm literally forming another idea for an art show right now. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. It's just like, hey, uh, does your gallery have 10 HDTVs <laughs> that I can use? <laughs> Put them uh, vertically oriented, right? Um, and no, I think that is definitely uh, something that should and, and probably will become a lot more Absolutely. commonplace, for sure. Especially as AR emerges, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. We're getting so many awesome yeah. art show ideas. Um, you guys have fun. We're going to go and we're going to plan some, some <laughs> other things that are... <laughs> you can keep yourselves busy, right? Yeah, entertain yourselves in the chat. <laughs> um, okay, but for real though, um, I've got a sketch that I worked on. Um, With and, real paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. And then I actually brought this in and in kind of trying to re-familiarize myself with, with drawing and Photoshop and stuff, I actually uh, redrew it digitally. Hmm. Um, so, but it does still very much look like a sketch. So I'm gonna grab that here. There he is. And I'm just gonna drag that into my canvas here. Boom. That could so, be a finished piece right there. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah it wouldn't be as interesting <laughs> in a gallery. Because you can see it's got, it's got some work to do. Mm -hmm. It's just like a, a, a guideline sketch so that I can paint with it. But um, I mentioned my my kind of cynical commentary. Um, so this piece is going to be, are you content with being content? I'm sure the irony isn't lost on you, being on Adobe Live presenting this. That's what it's all about. <laughs> like I've literally made my career on social media. I think it's awesome. uh, it's and funny. Instagram has played a massive role in that. Mm. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I realize a lot of the ways that it's like, you know, kind of changed the way I think about design and the world and whatever. And um, and there's a lot of days where I just feel like, you know what, I don't feel like performing yeah. <laughs> for everybody on Instagram today. I'm going to skip this week. Sometimes um, I go without doing anything. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot to, to think about with this stuff. So um, while I will continue to use it constantly and um, see it as a tool that's super valuable for my work, um, it doesn't mean I can't poke fun at it a little bit. So. <laughs> So I've got this guy in here. I'm going to also bring in my background. Let's drag that in there. Yeah, there he is. So this is my background that I did on the plane yesterday. I spent a little more time getting a little bit more of a, a nice gradient. Oh, I didn't have this zoomed out quite enough for dropping that in there. Let me, there we go guides out your friend. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to actually work um, between 
-hmm. my background and my sketch so that I can kind of see that guideline and have it stay on top of my my work so I can kind of work underneath it like a like a transparency almost um, while still doing it over my my background so I can kind of at all times see what that's looking like in contrast to that dark backdrop so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my sketch on top of that background and then I'm gonna do command I to invert that that is like super dark. How about that? Okay, so let's let's play with some adjustment levels here. Actually, let's just well grabbing instead of clicking. Let's do a screen overlay. There we go. And that's perfectly fine. Okay. So now he's in there, and I can create my my drawing layers right in between. Like that. And now I can work under my sketch and over my background. Pretty sweet. Great. All right. Um, so I've got some brushes that I've kind of allocated for, for use here. And my brush dialog and restarting my computer disappeared. So let me get that back on here. Dun, dun, dun. This window. Leonardo, we're working on um, some letter Letter-based design, what did you call it? Um, Letter-focused art. Letter-focused art <laughs> um, in Photoshop. Yeah. So yeah, my studio is Alpha, A-L-F-A, -A, which is Advocates for the Letter-Focused Arts. Um, and again, that just means like anything that has to do with letters um, as, it, as it comes to design, because um, it's all super important and crucial to any great design is like super solid letters. And I feel like a lot of times, uh, you know, companies feel like, or agencies even for that matter, are like, okay, yeah, we've got somebody in house that can manipulate mm. some fonts and take care of the, the letter part. Um, and then what in inevitably happens is they come to someone like me uh, at the last minute with no budget left, and they're like, hey, can you get this done for us like yesterday? And I'm like, maybe you should have focused on this as important as it was instead of thinking you had somebody mm -hmm. um, that could do it then realizing at the last minute that they couldn't. Um, so just kind of pushing for a little bit more respect for, for the importance of this craft. Um, okay, so I've got some brushes down here. Oh. What do you choose? I know. Well, so I've got a lot of uh, Kyle Webster's brushes in here, uh, which are all free if you're yes. uh, subscribed to Creative Cloud. Um, so really, really good. Do I always work in CMYK? I actually actually usually don't. Um, I didn't really come from a, a printing background, really. So um, I've never quite fully understood CMYK, if I'm being perfectly honest. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, I'm. I'm Am I in? I am in CMYK. Maybe right someone now. in the chat can <laughs> can explain. Let's switch. Not that it matters, but because I'm not going to print this per se. And now I'm uh, learning Photoshop again by figuring out where I'm at. Oh, that's fine. Oh, We're all in it together. Nope. Kathleen says must protect there and respect go. designerinos. And she also notes Don't that you'll play. be able to use Kyle's brushes in Fresco. Which is great. I know. I have. Well, that's that's why my sketch was looking weird because I was in CMYK. Okay. There you go. We're um, much brighter yeah. now. There we go. Okay. Um, so I did. I had to like hard restart my computer mm. earlier, so um, I had organized out some brushes. I'm gonna just have to go find that's them okay. again. That's okay. That's totally cool. This is a perfect time for me to remind folks that we have a chat and win in oh, four yeah. and a half minutes. Um, so definitely. If you haven't already, comment in the chat, ask uh, Ryan some questions, and you'll be nice. eligible to win 100 free stickers. Sticker up those laptops, your kids' <laughs> backpacks and notebooks. My uh, Both of my kids' bikes are covered with stickers cool. from like my friends and stuff. Because um, as you can see, I've kept my computer uh, fairly minimal, but I get a lot of stickers all the time from people that make amazing things, and then they usually, usually end up getting distributed to all. <laughs> Love that. Um, okay, so I'm trying to think of which one it was that I want to use. Um, my favorite thing to do with this stuff, though, is to just start grabbing things and just playing around with them, right? Um, so I like a lot of Kyle's brushes that have tilt in them. 
Um, and they're, the way that he names the brushes are always really helpful. You, mm. can, um, you can see kind of what a brush is gonna do a lot of times just by the name. Um, so if it's got tilt in it, that means that it's going to respect um, something like, you know, your, your Wacom um, stylus, I guess that's what they call it, pen. Um, or an Apple Pencil if you're using an, I, an, an iPad with, uh, with AstroPad like I'm doing today. Um, it respects that so that depending on which way you're holding it and what attitude your hand is in um, is going to determine how that brush is applied to the canvas. So I always really like to, to have that because um, I've never been a um, kind of a calligraphy minded mm. person where, you know, having the, the brush shape being like at a certain angle the whole time is really important to me. And in fact, I don't work well that way. So mm. uh, I like to use the tilt ones that he's got. Um, and let's grab white just for, for starters here. And then what I can do is zoom in here. And again, my layer that I'm working in is underneath my sketch. So as I draw, it won't cover my sketch, which is really important for kind of keeping things in line. Oop, that is too big, isn't it? Let's do this. Let's come down a little bit. Still too big. Almost the right size for that guy. That brush is so cool. Yeah. I love the texture and yeah. all of this stuff too. A little it's transparency. So Oof. <laughs> um, Adrian would like to know how it was working on that Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition with Tyra Banks at all. Well, you know, um, I call her Tyra now because we're friends. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, no, I didn't meet anybody. I did it all from <laughs> my, my house. Um, but it was really, really cool to be a part of, um, of something. You know, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue is not typically my thing. Um, but, I'm really squeaky today. Um, but it ended up being an, uh, an issue that was like really pretty progressive and, and diverse and stuff. So um, as things started shaping up and I learned more about what all was gonna be in it and who else was participating and everything, I started feeling really good about that. And just um, working on something that is that big of a, a pull to um, to be able to like tell my mom about and stuff <laughs> was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and it was funny because I was telling her that I was going to have a lot of work in the, the upcoming swimsuit issue, and she's just like, well, I guess I'll have to buy one now. And I was just <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I wasn't gonna, you know, I have never, literally never bought one either, but, um, and then she said uh, that my, my stepfather was just like, oh man, now I'll have to buy one too. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm sure you're really <laughs> put out. <laughs> so, but no, it was really cool. It was, uh, you know, obviously a big, big name, thing that um, was super fun to do. And actually my first uh, first actual editorial Ooh. gig for one reason or another, I don't know why. But. It's pretty cool to see a magazine like that caring about lettering. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, and looking back a little bit, they've, um, at least for that issue, they've pretty regularly reached out to pretty big name mm. people. So to be included with that was pretty cool. Um, just in my issue alone, um, Jessica Hish did a piece um, specifically for the the U.S. soccer, the women's soccer team spread that they did. Love them. So good. Um, and, oh God, who else was in there? Um, Eric Marinovich did a little bit in mm. there. Um, Kyle LaTondra from Chicago did a couple pieces in there as well. So it was a, it was a pretty, pretty good crew to be a part of. So I'm just kind of going through here and just kind of starting to fill in these little areas. Um, and if I want, I can come in here with my eraser. There's a really good question for you. Yeah. Um, how do you prevent your curves and letters from looking the same from one project to another? Actually, before that, okay. it's time for a chat and win. Ah, chat and win time. So everybody ask all these questions for Ryan and um, you'll be able to win 100 stickers. I think it's so awesome. What are you okay. gonna make with those stickers? Let us know in the chat and we'll pick a winner shortly. <laughs> oh, I love All these right. fireworks. So happy and inspiring, exciting for that chat and win. Um, everyone wants stickers. <laughs> Kathleen, gonna... you can't win the stickers, okay? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Brian, Mashira, Gerard, who's gonna win it? 
Oh, I see Steven, I see Shauna. What's up, guys? All kinds of friends in the chat, love it. Logos, so summer-like, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> How do you switch an angle for your mm -hmm. pencil? Oh, good call. But the other question was, um, how do you keep your letters from looking the same all the time? Right, um, it's tough, right? Oh, because- Mashira. Hey! You're the winner. Send us each a sticker, please. please yeah. For- It might go to my kids, but they'll love it, <laughs> I promise. Yeah, it'll be on a bicycle riding around yeah. Boston. Or a water bottle or something. My daughter was actually looking on Amazon. I, I kid you not, I saw it in my cart at one time, because they don't have their own Amazon accounts, of course, but they were like, um, my daughter had a, a thing in the cart that was like a pack of stickers for water bottles. I was just like, Lyric, don't <laughs> buy somebody else's decided collection of stickers for your water bottle. You gotta build that collection up yourself, <laughs> right? Um, so we, got, we need more options for mm -hmm. her to do that with. <laughs> and for those of you who didn't win, we still have a super good deal for you, which is that um, you can get 10 stickers for $1 if you use this code. It's a deal. It's a deal. All right, so Everybody letters not looking the same. Right, so um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question because, um, you know, unless you start dealing with different languages and stuff, there's a good chance that you're gonna be using mostly these same 26 letters that we all use all the time and, and all have for our entire lives, right? Um, so finding ways to do that in a different enough way every time to where it's unique and fun, but also solves the problem that, that you're trying to solve and then also uh, is legible as the letter still, right? <laughs> There's a lot of really cool things you could do that you know may affect readability in the end. So kind of balancing all of those different things um, is a really strong challenge. And one of the things that make this, makes this work so fun is, um, is the, the challenge that that presents every single time. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, of kind of learning what styles of lettering um, convey different messages, right? There's there's some styles that are a lot more casual and better suited for, you know, like an advertisement for like a kid's thing mm -hmm. or something, a kid's product or toy or something. Um, and then there's ones that are like really neat and tidy and elegant that are great for jewelry company logos or, you know, whiskey bottles, stuff like that. So um, kind of figuring out what different styles mean different things and say different things to people. Um, goes a long way yeah. in kind of deciding how you you choose to do those things in a certain area. And a lot of times too, it's just, it comes down to uh, what letters and words it is that mm -hmm. you have to work with on a specific thing, right? Do you have any letters that you love to draw and are there specific letters that you just have a hard time with? I get asked, asked this a lot <laughs> and sometimes it changes. So again, it, a lot of times really depends on the context, mm -hmm. so sometimes a letter will be just perfect for how I needed to interact with something else and I don't mind that letter. And then other times, a letter that I really, really love can just be really problematic in a, <laughs> in a certain design because of the things that it's like clashing with in right. the piece, right? Um, in general though, if I'm just drawing letters and just kind of like having fun, I really like to draw S's, which is kind of the opposite of, oh, yeah. of what a lot of people usually say, right? Because it's it's can be tricky, um, but I like that challenge, and I think that there are a lot of really fun and beautiful ways to do those. Um, as far as least favorites go, uh, the script capital I Ooh. is one of the most annoying letters to draw ever because all of the typical ways that you can do a capital script I are just typically not ones that people immediately recognize as yeah. eyes. <laughs> yeah. So Hard you end up with something that is technically an eye, but then like everybody's like, is that a, is that a T? Uh, what, what is that thing? Is it a J? Um, so it's you really got to bank on context in that case. So if the context of what comes after that isn't really strong, that points to that being an eye, um, then you got to really get super creative on those sometimes. Mm -hmm. So. Dana wants to know what if you have any recommended lettering books. Oh man, so many. Um, so I have, I'm trying to think of a, if I have a great place to point people to. Uh, I know I have a, a resources page on my, my website um, that has a bunch of recommended tools and things like that. 
Um, I don't know if I've got books on there currently. I need to need to change that. But um, some of the great ones, especially for, for lettering focused stuff, which is of course the things that I am most familiar with um, as far as research goes. Um, Doyle Young, um, D-O-Y-A-L-D, like Donald with a Y instead of an N. Um, was probably hands down the most prolific and universally talented letter-based artist and mm -hmm. designer of all time. Um, I don't know, all time might be strong, but there's a, there's a good argument for it. And he's got several books out there that can be kind of hard to find sometimes. And if you can find them, sometimes they're prohibitively expensive. Yeah. That was a hard, hard word to say live. Um, <laughs> but if you can get a hold of those, Dangerous Curves is Dangerous my curves. favorite. Um, it is just full of really, really powerful little tidbits of information. Um, and he just like, just casually drops these like incredibly helpful gems in the little text next to a piece that he's got in there. Um, and that was really, really good. As far as more practical like resources for learning, um, Martina Floor, uh, another, I think she's been on live a, a while back. Definitely, yeah. Um, I know she, she's she got maybe my favorite book right now for, for learning how to do lettering. It's really, really comprehensive. Um, she goes into some great detail on a lot of things and she's got everything illustrated out really nicely in there um, on all kinds of things from balance and you know negative space to the actual shapes themselves and style and everything. So definitely recommend those. That's a lot of reading to do. Yeah. It's important. There's not a ton of other great ways to learn this stuff. Um, there's a lot of Skillshares and stuff these days for sure, which is a lot more than I could say for when I was starting out. But um, you know, sometimes the best the best way to learn is to find somebody that you see is clearly doing it right and um, knows how to how to do it for themselves, and then asking them how how to do it or finding the resources that they already have available, yeah. like Martina's book, for instance. So if you're here with us right now, you're already on the right track. That's right. This stuff is great. The fact that Adobe does this is like mind blowing to me that this place isn't just jam packed with, <laughs> with people at all times, crashing servers and everything. So I just hit a little button up at the top. Um, this guy right here, which will turn on um, pressure sensitivity for, for size control. Um, so when you're building a Photoshop brush, you don't have to build in that responsiveness to pressure um, to change the size. You can have that apply, you know, different pressures can apply to just opacity of the mm -hmm. brush or whatever, a lot of different things in Photoshop. Um, but the way that I like to work, I really like it to respond to my pressure for size because that's the way that I would do this in an analog setting, right? I press harder if I want it bigger and stuff. So um, with that tool there at the top, you can kind of turn that on for any brush and um, have that be the way it responds regardless of what the brush settings are. Um, if that's off, then you're just at the, the mercy of whatever that brush was designed to do on its own. Um, you also have one over here for opacity too. So if you like right. it to respond with more pressure for a darker, more full brush and lighter with the light pressure, you can do that with that button too. Um, I usually like mine to stay um, as, as strong as I can get them. So I leave that one off, but having that size is good. And I'm actually gonna drop this size down a little bit more so I can build those shapes up on my own. And that, I mean, that's how a calligraphic um, pen would work too. Right. Pressing harder would widen your stroke. Um, Tima has all kinds of awesome questions. Um, sh they want to know what was the biggest surprise for you when you started lettering? Did you have any misconceptions going in and um, what kind of clients are more likely to hire you? It's a great question. And I, um, I think, uh, gosh, when I, first, when I first started trying to learn this stuff, it was, I guess around 2011 or so. Um, and I just mentioned a second ago briefly that there was not a whole lot of resources available out there, um, especially not like there are today with, with Skillshare being what it is and stuff and, and similar tools. Um, but I had never, my entire life, um, I had only recently at that point decided that I was going to try my hand at being a designer. Mm -hmm. um, no design school, no uh, prior experience, no contacts in the industry, nothing. I just um, kind of decided on a whim that this is what I was going to do next. Uh, 
a lot of privilege that goes into thinking you can <laughs> do something like that. But um, I had just previously been really focused on trying to teach myself web design mm -hmm. um, and just kind of like learning HTML and CSS and just kind of starting out with the basics. And the thing that was cool about that was that every time I came to a, a hiccup or like came across something I didn't know, I'd go to Google and in five minutes I'd have my answer, right? And I would just move on. The resources were out there, they were everywhere and they were free. They were easy to find, all that. And so every time I came to something that I didn't know, I could kind of quickly get over that, learn it and move on. Um, and so when I decided that I was going to try out this lettering thing that I was kind of just randomly realizing was a thing out of nowhere, um, so weird. I, I, I've never been the type to be like obsessed with signage or mm -hmm. <laughs> typography in any way my entire life up to that point. It just kind of didn't even register with me. Um, but all of a sudden I noticed it uh, and it was, I couldn't turn it off after <laughs> that. Um, so I kind of just thought I would just handle that like I was handling web design and just hit Google and see how to do this thing. And I realized immediately like, oh, the resources are not there for this like they were for web design. Um, so I'm going to have to dig a little deeper and and ask people that I see doing it um, where to go and just start by figuring out what it is I didn't even know to learn how to get there, right? Like it was, uh, it was something where I just had to figure out and know what I didn't know so I could try and figure out how to get there. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of asking people for you know, their information and to be kind enough to share that with a goofball who um, <laughs> decided overnight that he was going to be a designer out of nowhere. And well, now you're returning the favor. Yeah, that's the idea. Try and make it a little easier than it was for me, for anybody else. <laughs> uh, Joseph is marveling at the fact that you have smoothing set to zero. Oh. <laughs> and Kathleen says that you're a boss. Thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> um, yeah, so smoothing. I definitely, definitely use smoothing a lot. Um, don't get it twisted that I don't feel like I need it or that I feel like that is a, a, a cheat of any kind. I do it all the time. Right now, I am kind of like coloring more, right? I'm kind of building up these shapes with more of a paint style rather than writing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, if I were actually doing like a, a lettering piece kind of just loose and, and fresh without this sketch that I was basing it off of, I would absolutely have sm smoothing on at least like, you know, 40, 50% um, and be using it like that. So um, good good thing to point out. And it's it's awesome there for when you need it. Um, and there's plenty of times when I definitely do need it. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, when I'm doing something like more detailed like this, I feel like keeping that off and being able to kind of like sketch things in a little bit more. Um, smoothing definitely gets in the way of that. If you're like trying to come in and, and clean things up and get a little detail, like right now I'm kind of just like repeatedly sketching in to build up some of that opacity in there because when I'm pressing light, it's it's nice and, and fine and, and the actual transfer of that brush onto the canvas is not very dark, so, um, or bright in this case since I'm using white, but um, so if I had smoothing on, it would be trying to like correct all my strokes and it would get really annoying really fast. So um, that's mostly why I have it off now, but good, good call. Martina's curious how you change the angle of the brush and is there a shortcut? So that is something that is built into this particular brush. Um, so this is one of those brushes from Kyle Webster that has what, he's, what he calls tilt built into it. And what that means is that it respects the, the angle of your pencil. So if I, let me zoom out here. Let me escape. Okay. One thing AstroPad could get better at is being better at zooming and pinching and rotating. Um, so with this pencil, it's going to respect way, the way I'm pointing it. So if I have it like this, it's going to kind of align the shape of the brush kind of extending out from my pencil. Um, if I do it like this, it's going to kind of keep respecting that and turn with it. So every time I put my pencil to the screen, it's going to figure out which way I'm holding that and which way the pencil is tilted and actually use it that way. So if you think of like a brush pen, for instance, which is very similar to what this is kind of designed to be, um, you wouldn't 
put your brush pen down like this and then have it be perpendicular to the tip of your your pen your brush pen like this right it's going to be kind of an extension from this same direction of your pencil so that is the way this one is designed to work they're not all like that right so if i have um so this one is pretty tilt is what he called <laughs> this one um but right around it there are other pretty brushes and this is where his naming becomes handy because tilt is the one that i want because i know i want to respect my pencil um, but right next to it there is pretty fixed so let's pick that one and see what that does now it's going to be big, but that'll be good for demonstrating. So if I just use that here, doesn't matter which way I hold my pencil, it's going to stay at that same angle. So whether I do this or whether I turn it like this, the when, angle of that brush tip stays the same. When does that come in handy? Really good for people that are actually good at calligraphy. <laughs> um, not me. I can do like black letter and stuff is like really hard for me. I don't have the discipline to keep those things like, I don't know, see how wheel it is and stuff. And it's funny, I um, have designed brushes and stuff before that are like this for people that like to use like parallel pans mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, it's totally for, for them to use, not for me, um, because I can't demonstrate it well. Um, but that's really good for that. Things like uh, graffiti styles and stuff where you would kind of be holding um, you know, your spray can in a certain way with like a flat tip or something. Um, stuff like that. Things that are, um, that are more for where you want a specific angle. Um, and you can change that angle too. I think somebody asked earlier um, how you change the angle mm -hmm. of a brush. Um, and my favorite way is again to have it work with my pencil and move as I do. But if you don't have a brush that's doing that, um, what you can do is you can go into the brush settings. So if I've got that fixed one selected and I go to my brush settings, which I have as another tab of the same window. Um, you can do that right down here in the, in the lower right. Let me see if I can, yeah, this guy right here. That is the angle of the brush. So we see this ovular shape, right? And obviously that's not the, the actual shape of the brush tip, but it is telling me what angle that brush tip is. Regardless of what the shape is, you can set the angle of it to be whatever it is. So if it's like a, a perfectly round uh, brush tip, then this is gonna matter less, right? It's just going to be kind of rotating the whatever texture lives in that brush tip. But for something like this, where the tip is actually, you know, longer than it is tall or whatever, that angle makes a big difference. So right now, it's at like that 30 degrees, right? But if I turn this, see how it changes in the preview too? It's kind of rolling over. So if I want the angle to be the other way, and I get that, which is a little bit more like what I would do um, because, again, I'm kind of using it like a brush pen. So that would be the way I would do it. But since it wouldn't move with me and it's fixed there, if I decided to do something else or hold my hand a different way, it would still be that angle, which is usually not what I'm looking for, but a perfectly valid uh, tool for a certain kind of styles. Really cool for doing things like uh, one, one that I always like to do is the word minimum. Ooh. because it is a word full of similar shapes um, and it's a good way to practice like um, pressure transition and all kinds of fun stuff. So if I do this, let's see. It's really easy to misspell too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're out of space. We can't read it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I ran out of room, let's try that again. <laughs> so satisfying this to watch you. Very important to get this right, right now. Okay. <laughs> you did it. You did it. Eye placement is very important. Oh yeah, now I can read it. Yeah, see? I know. Lovely. <laughs> but having that fixed angle tool like that is great for doing something like that if you just kind of rotate it the other way. Um, so that's kind of how you can I detached my brushes here. Move those guys back over here. Oh, jeez. Come on, guy. Do you play Fortnite? <laughs> no, Kathleen, I don't play Fortnite. <laughs> How did I know that was you? No, I literally saw it earlier randomly. Uh, <laughs> my son uh, was a heavy Fortnite player for a long time, and it was like in its like peak popularity. Uh, and maybe it still is, I don't know, but he's he's moved on. He's 14, though, so... 
trends and uh, what's what's hot is uh, very fleeting. Oh, yeah. with his <laughs> the floss is so passe. Oh my gosh, you floss, you're dead to me. <laughs> That's my son talking. Um, but yeah, so all kinds of incredible ways you can change these these brushes to really do what you want um, and behave exactly like whatever analog tool it is that you're trying to, to recreate. And I'm gonna need to kind of like guess what size I was at. I think it was in the 30s. I'll start with that. And get back to filling in this bad boy. That feels a little big still. So just a reminder, in about 38 minutes, we're going to do some portfolio reviews. Oh, yeah. And that you definitely want to participate, um, get some feedback from Ryan. Um, and some maybe some sage advice. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see uh, what kind of spirits uh, <laughs> decide to take over and speak through me. What sages I have available to me. <laughs> so I figured today um, we'd kind of start by kind of like sketching this in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then since we're going to be back again tomorrow, I feel like um, tomorrow we'll kind of spend a little more time um, stylizing, adding a little bit of like maybe some color and some texture and shadow and stuff like that using some of these other awesome brushes. Maybe I'll get my brushes that I um, painstakingly organized and um, selected specifically for this and I'll, I'll refine those since I lost them all because um, my computer decided to really, um, I was gonna say something that I probably shouldn't. Um, it didn't didn't do something kind to the bed this morning. Is, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I wanted to say. Happens um, to the best of us. Yeah, yeah, is what it is. Technology, man. That's what you got to deal with when you decide to be a digital artist. But pros far outweigh the cons because I can never do something like this in mm. near the time that I can do it in Photoshop. That's for sure. If we weren't interrupting you every five seconds, um, <laughs> what would your pace be? Like, how long would my pace? Yeah, um, it really depends on uh, you know the specific project and the actual letters that I'm using, right? So uh, sometimes things go really, really great, and I can just really get in the zone and knock a piece out in an afternoon. Literally, like I've I've had times where everything is just running on all cylinders, everything is going great. And I turned my pressure off. That's why I'm confused as to what's happening. Um, and everything's awesome, and I get exactly what I want out of a thing. Um, and all the letters are just like really helpful, <laughs> and they work together and present fun little ways they can interact with each other. And then other times, the opposite happens. Um, <laughs> I can't get in the zone. I can't uh, figure out a way to handle a really challenging you know, conflict between two letters that are just like really inconveniently placed in the words that I need to use. Um, and, I, and I'll take two weeks on something. Yeah. Um, not constantly eight hours a day, two weeks, but um, you know, when you have something like that though, it also is kind of like demotivating too, right? So like right. You, you like put it away more often and, uh, and don't stick with it as much and you kind of like have to keep leaving and coming back to something because it's frustrating you or whatever. So sometimes, you know, that happens, you know, regularly still, even after this long and this much practice and whatever, um, you know, I know what to do and sometimes I just can't get, <laughs> can't get the hands to do it the right way that I want it to or I can't find the right solution right away. So it really all is kind of at the mercy of what I'm working with. I get that a lot too. If you, if you have suggestions for overcoming a bad design day, share them in the chat because we'd love to hear them. Um, do you frequently show your work to other people in progress? Because I find that it's at least, so I'm not, I'm not a letterer. I, I don't make letter-based artworks. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I find that it's difficult for me to tell if something looks good, if, I, if others can read it. Do you often show people? Um, so a couple of things about this. I, what is happening right here? I cannot get that space to be dark. That's so weird. Um, I was like, something was blocking me right there. Oh, you know what? That's a dead spot on my iPad. I need, <laughs> oh, no. I need to get it replaced. Um, it's constantly breaking my stroke and everything. Anyway, um, I was like, what's happening? And then I zoom in and it's working fine. Um, no, I mean, that's kind of like how I started my career was um, as I was kind of teaching myself this stuff and realizing that it was going to come down to a lot of just 
trial and error and mm -hmm. practice because of the resources that weren't available. Um, I just really kind of learned in the open um, and posted a lot of my works in progress on Instagram and stuff. And of course, at that time, I wasn't really doing a lot of paid work for clients for a while. Um, so that was really easy. Nowadays, um, I do try and share as much as I can, but you know, when you start working with different clients and stuff, it can be tricky because a lot of times you can't share things until right. everything's done. And um, but even still, like when I do finally share something, I'll I'll often try if I've got really good um, photos or sketches of the process, I'll try and share those alongside the final piece so it's not just a portfolio and it's, you know, got some of that content as well. Because that stuff um, from other people that were doing this as I was trying to learn was so fundamentally helpful to me learning was kind of seeing how they did that. And, um, and Doyle Young's books, for instance, again, um, what that consists of is it'll be like a final piece that he did, but then like every stage of the sketches. So like you can see what he started with and what ideas he had that were not what ended up being the case. Um, and then he like just blurbs real short and brief about why he chose to go forward mm -hmm. with this one or that one. Um, and knowing that and seeing that kind of um, process and, and the thought that goes into making those certain decisions is like some of the most powerful information you can have as you're trying to figure out how to do that for yourself. Um, so I always try and, and share as much of that as I can where I can and a lot of times that doesn't happen um, in the process anymore. But uh, you know, it's, it's super important and I highly recommend that if you can share what you're doing to do it because not only will that be helpful to somebody else, but um, it can be a great opportunity for somebody to give you some feedback if they, if they have it. Like if I see something from somebody that I feel like I've got some really helpful information that could help them improve that, and I hold it to myself where I say like, great job, or give them like a hard eyes smiley face, that is doing them a major disservice, right? Absolutely. Um, and if they wouldn't post it at all, then I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't know. We'd see the, fin the final piece, and then I'd be like the guy coming in and be like, do uh, you want any feedback on that? After they've <laughs> already been paid for it, it's already live, and they don't have any control over it anymore, that is really not helpful. Um, so yeah, if you can share in the process, do it. So folks uh, are saying that they listen to their favorite music to get over a bad design day. Um, Tom says that he finds a real killer is when a project on a project is when he's fired up and cranking on it and it goes on hold. Mm. It's easy to lose the passion once it starts back up. For sure, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a real struggle to like not being able to stay. Uh, in that zone on something, and I, I know this as well as anybody. I, um, my entire career has been working from home to this point, mm -hmm. um, and I have kids, so in a, a petting zoo where the animals at home as well, three dogs and two cats. So <laughs> the entire time that I've been doing this has been all around being like a stay-at-home dad too. So um, you know, if things need done or the house needs picked up or whatever, like. Those things need to happen too, and that's usually me because my wife works out of the house and gets way more money than I do. So, is is what it is. So, but when you're trying to like really hone in on something and really focus, um, having it broken up or across even one day is really hard to kind of stay in that flow. So when when things like that happen, where you get um, put on hold uh, on a project, which happens a lot, um, then you know. Luckily, sometimes it picks back up. Pick, picks back up if you're lucky, um, and that can be really, really tricky. You know, you've you moved on to other other things, and you've been in a totally different headspace on another project that's a totally different style, whatever. And coming back can be can be tough. So anytime you can really dedicate it yourself to knocking one thing out, that's always preferred. But it's typically not the way it goes. Well, it's no wonder that you're still so productive despite being interrupted constantly. You have lots of practice. <laughs> I do. I've learned to tune it out. Luckily, I'm not tuning you out. That would be hilarious, <laughs> wouldn't it? Like, huh? Hmm? What? what? I am. Uh, I'm just drawing here. <laughs> Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah, so I've got practice at that, too. I've never heard my iPad be so squeaky. I, I kind of like it. it. I cleaned it right before we did this, so Squeaky's it's usually clean. dirty as hell. <laughs> I don't have that problem, but here we go. 
We're gonna squeak, squeak, squeak. Bobby says thank you for sharing about working from home. I think it's a more and more normal way to go about doing work. Yeah. Um, Miguel asks, do you think uh, the iPad makes your process smoother and faster? Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. I Now, I will always, for, the, for all of my days, um, be a strong advocate for pencil and paper. Mm. Um, because at the end of the day, if, if all this stuff went away, I could still get to this point or any point that I needed to with pencil and paper. When I do workshops and stuff, unless it's like a specific iPad lettering workshop, which I do sometimes as well, um, I always focus mostly on pencil and paper. Not even really so much like brush pens and stuff because, you know, yes, those things are helpful and can be really efficient for getting certain styles and stuff like that more quickly. Um, but, you know, the, a common trope online, especially if you're sharing lettering work, is people asking, like, what pen do you use? <laughs> and I'm like, listen. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't matter, first of all. Um, that's irrelevant to why this is looking the way it is. Um, you can do this with a pencil as well, but uh, here it is because I'm not totally mean. Um, but, you know, the, the, the brush and the tools are just like, you know, there's some that are specifically geared to make doing a certain thing quicker and easier for sure, but, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. As long as you've got that pencil and paper, you can accomplish any of these things the same way. But that being said, having an undo button for sketching is like so glorious. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously you can get that with, with drawing in Photoshop too. Um, and you know, with any tool that you're using, iPad or not. But uh, yeah, I mean, just having this, this interaction, drawing directly on the piece that you're working on, um, whether that be a Cintiq or an iPad or something like that, it's just, um, is so much more helpful than like even just a regular Wacom graphics tablet, right? That cognitive dissonance and that disconnect from like looking here while drawing here, like it's better than drawing with a mouse usually, but it's like, it's nothing like drawing on the screen that you're actually seeing it on. And you know, the iPad, you can't beat the portability of it for, for doing this kind of thing with your computer. So it is a total game changer. Have you looked at the what pen do you use uh, hashtag? There's some good stuff there. <laughs> Probably is. No, I don't think I have. Um, I see usually more um, satirical commentary on the idea of asking what pen people <laughs> use nowadays more than actual like legit questions of people wanting to really know what pen you're using. But um, yeah, it's become a hilarious thing. Oh, I, I didn't finish my G up there. Whoops. I love that crossbar so much. This guy? Yeah. Is that the right is that the right term? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I would call it. Yeah, I was trying to think like, does it have a technical term? <laughs> no, I call it crossbar. Maybe it does have a technical technical term. Again, I'm self-taught, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know all the terminology. And there's that G. So this is cool. If I come this way, um, instead of spinning my iPad all around or trying to Mm. fight with AstroPad's like kind of goofiness on rotating, I can just turn and since that brush is, is following what my pencil is doing, I can kind of get that reached over there. I talk a lot in my workshops, especially about hand attitudes. I've said mm. attitudes a couple times here too, but um, even on pencil and paper um, and with just a pencil, you can do a lot just by um, changing the way that you're approaching an area of the sketch or whatever. Like if you've got a shape like this, if you've got an outline of letters like I've got here, um, if I'm going in to clean up an edge or something, for instance, let me just, you know what, let me just grab a different pencil, or I want a pencil brush, grab a different brush. Let's go to, I'll just come all the way to the top here and grab, oh, I just had a pencil a second ago. Here we go. Pencil, pencil, pencil. Now they're all gonna hide from me. Close enough, okay. So here's a little thin, thin brush. Let me make that 
little smaller. Okay, go away. So if I'm in here and I'm trying to fill this little this little area right here, okay, um, if I'm pretending like this is paper and pencil and I want to come in and give me my Photoshop workspace, I'm gonna go down a little bit smaller even. Another cool thing about AstroPad is you can kind of, oh, you probably couldn't see that actually, but um, they've got an actual specific Photoshop workspace and Illustrator mm -hmm. workspace. So you can have like a little, um, little sidebar of specific tools. Like right now I've got uh, brush eraser, undo, redo, um, and brush plus, brush minus. So you can quickly kind of change your brush size cool. like that and zoom in and zoom out. So you can kind of customize those for little shortcuts. Um, pretty handy. Um, so anyway, if I've got this guy and I want to fill in this area, inside's easy. It's just coloring within the lines. But as I'm doing those those edges, it really makes a difference which way you're approaching it by. So if I'm wanting to do that left edge of there, if I do it, if I rotate this and I try and do it from this side, this is actually like premium paid uh, workshop content I'm giving you guys here <laughs> that I don't usually do. For free. Um, yeah. So if I'm doing it from this side, and this is a terrible brush to use. <laughs> so, so I can find, this is important. Um, Let's see, pencil, pencil, pencil. Okay. Hi, Angelique. Hi, Munir. Thanks for joining. We're talking about hand attitudes. Hand which attitudes. We're, we're not really sure what that means yet, but we'll, hopefully we'll find out. Get in there. Okay, yeah, this is a better brush. Okay, so let me erase all this nonsense here. That's not big enough. This is gonna be worth it. Bear with me. I'm so excited. So, all right, we're talking about this little shape right here and filling him in neatly and getting crisp edges. So this guy is what we're filling in, and I can color in the middle easy enough without causing any trouble. It's just like coloring in the lines, which is not always easy. But, um, so if I'm over here and I'm trying to do this, a couple things happen. So as you are doing little short sketchy strokes like this, each one of those little strokes is shaped based on the pivot of your hand, right? So if I've got my hand down here, okay, right here, and I'm sketching, right? Your hand is a pivot point. So every sketch you make, I mean, obviously people can draw straight lines by just maneuvering differently, but by default, that pivot often plays into each little stroke that you make. Mm -hmm. So if you are doing that and you're like trying to do like fine detailed sketching, even those short little sketches, those short little sketch strokes are slightly curved. So curving those counter to that, um, that stroke is hard, right? It's a lot di more difficult to get a nice shape that way. But even when you're doing like little tiny little things where you feel like that probably won't matter, every one of those little curved lines is in this case going outside of the, the edge that I'm trying to create. So let me go ahead and hide my sketch so we can see. Mm -hmm. See how jagged that thing is over there? Perry. And even if I try and like clean that up, every time I deviate from that line that I'm trying to make, it's deviating outside. So instead of doing it there, let me bring this back in. <laughs> Rotate. Rotate. Okay, bring this guy over here. And if I approach that edge from what would be, <laughs> I've never figured out how to say this, that didn't sound really weird, but if you sketch an edge from the side of the inside of that edge, so for this case, we're talking about this edge over here, right? So the inside of that shape would be on this side, right? So if I sketch that from over here, then any deviation that I make from that path that I'm trying to create is happening inside the line and it doesn't matter because it's all gonna get filled over there. So if I erase this choppy, fuzzy stroke that I've done and I do it from this side, oh, brush. Now I can kind of build this shape up and all those little curved strokes mm -hmm. are all putting their round sides to the outside. 
And so it makes for that smoother, more detailed overall edge. What a great tip. I didn't do that like super well, but well enough to, <laughs> well enough to screw it all up. Um, so now when I hide that, still could be better, but as a quick demonstration, you can see it's like 10 times better mm -hmm. than doing it from that other direction. So even just like thinking about where you're coming at apart from uh, <laughs> and that hand attitude and where your, uh, where your hand is relative to what you're doing and using that pivot point of your hand to help you rather than to make your life miserable. Okay, yeah, I guess I can leave that there. Let's do that. Let's go back to my <laughs> old pretty, pretty tilt. Where'd he go? See, and he's all in a nice folder. Everyone is thankful and impressed for that tip. Thank you. A lot of, a lot of doing it wrong to figure <laughs> out that simple little dumb trick. A lot of my tricks are dumb tricks. Like, <laughs> Except, like, are not the most sophisticated thoughts and ideas, but like make a huge difference. So they've been like really, really helpful in my my path to learning how to wrangle this stuff. Too big. The physicality of letters is something that's always interest interested me a lot, like they look a certain way because the hand moves a certain way. Right. Yeah, and even so like cool. when you're drawing these these letters like this, and like I mostly do, like I'm, I'm not a calligrapher. I can do some calligraphy when I need to, or to kind of get some ideas out. I'll do like a, a brush pen thing and actually write the letters out to see how mm -hmm. they might look together or get some ideas. Um, but that is by far, or no, far from, is what I meant to say, my focus. Um, my focus is definitely drawing these letters, um, sketching them, you know, and all that, and actually considering each of these little areas of space and, mm. and positive and negative space and all that. It's a, it's a designed letter. So um, in doing that, you can kind of lose sight of the fact that these are all based on how they would be written, right? So depending on what tool it is, whether it's a brush or a pointed calligraphy pen, right? Um, the ways that those write influence everything from even fonts, right? All of those things that we now load into Photoshop and Illustrator and type out with a keyboard, they used to be all done by hand, right? right. Even like the serifs and, and everything else, all the Roman things, the geogra uh, geographic, geometric um, shaped letters and all that, it was all done with brushes and pens. Um, or a chisel in some cases. <laughs> yeah, this is mind blowing to me. I could never. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. Oh my God. There's people now that still like practice that and it's just mind blowing. But yeah, I mean, it's all it's all based on, on handmade stuff and it's wild to think of it that way in, in today's context. But um, yeah, that's where we get all the little rules and stuff of typography is like, that's how it was done and that's how it is familiar to us, right? You can, we talked earlier about how these are all the same letters that everybody knows and can write, but, you know, there's only so far you can push those creatively until they stop becoming that letter, right? right. <laughs> so you've got a framework to live within where it's still legible and everything, but, um, you know, what you can do within those parameters is, is the fun challenge. You were talking earlier about uh, you were doing um, a linoleum cut. Did that change the way that you designed your letters? It absolutely did. Um, there is a hilarious story that goes with that piece, aside from the fact that I almost did it backwards. Um, that was less Before fun. you that did was... it on purpose backwards. <laughs> right. <laughs> that one, that one stayed, yeah. <laughs> I almost didn't do it backwards, that's right. Um, but yeah, that, um, that piece was for a poster show that Austin does every year as part of the AIGA. It's called the After Hours Poster mm -hmm. Show. And it's um, it's like a curated show of designers. They allow 40 designers um, to do it. Everybody does a poster and they print 40 of them. And then they are they go up during East, which is like a popular, um, like a art studio 
crawl, mm -hmm. for lack of better words, kind of all around town that people participate in. And it goes on during that thing, and people can buy, and then there's always a charity associated with it and everything. Um, and it's it's really awesome. But the I was accepted into the into the show, and I'm using the wrong tool. Distractions. Um, I had this amazing poster design. In fact, I'm gonna show it because it's awesome and it doesn't exist. There it is. Wow. So that is a design that I took a ton of time, too much time. Oops. Thank you, Magnet. Um, made this poster and I was like, cool, the theme was music. So this is a Frank Ocean quote from one of my favorite songs of his. Um, and it's from the song Wither. And you can see that the shapes in the background, maybe you can see, um, actually spell Wither. And then there's flowers to kind of go with the lyrics. Anyway. I did this thing that I was super, super proud of. The half toning on this thing is insane. Mm. I think, I'm tooting my own horn now, Oof, but. That would be a fun one to print. Super fun print job, wow. right? So it was a real nice challenge for whoever got to print it. Uh, it wasn't gonna be me. Um, <laughs> but because I painstakingly perfected this thing to a point where I was finally happy with it, I was out of time for any print shop to be able to print it for me. Mm. So, instead of getting this printed, um, I was faced with this dilemma of either being, a, you know, having to back out of this show that only had 40 spots that I was accepted for one of, um, would be failing this charity that was for kids. Um, I would be among the community of designers and AIGA and everybody else there, um, I would have really dropped the ball mm -hmm. on our entire community. Um, and it would have been a really bad look. And I was really, really close to just having to do it because I was out of options. I couldn't print that myself. I didn't have the tools or the supplies in the first place, but even if it did, I would not be able to pull that print yeah. off by, by any stretch of the imagination, especially in the time I had. Um, so I was legit considering um, just having to back out. And it wasn't until the Friday morning before the Sunday deadline to turn all your printed posters in that I decided to not back out. Um, and the only way that I knew of that I could myself print 40 posters over the course of a weekend was to do a block print. And I've only done like one of those before. So I had that, oops, nope. Um, I had that knowledge, but it wasn't strong knowledge. <laughs> I just knew where to find the supplies, what to buy and knew that I could theoretically do that if I wanted to literally spend my entire weekend on it. Um, so I came up with a totally different design um, that was a lot more simple, and which is the point that led me to this thing, your question about uh, designing differently for use in a block print, right? Mm -hmm. So I did bolder, um, lower contrast letters that were like a little bit more straightforward. Um, one color. <laughs> it was uh, basically a black print on white paper because those were the things I could find in time, not being a print shop myself. Um, and so that was what it was. And it was it was fine. It wasn't as, it's something I wasn't as proud of as that one, but it was fine. I didn't have to back out. I managed to, to make the deadline and had something in there. Didn't sell a whole lot of posters, but um, where this story gets really, really interesting is what came of not backing out of that poster show. Do you wanna hear it? Yes. Do we have time? Yes. Okay, so there's some deadlines in 10 minutes for your yeah, portfolio. Yeah, so if you already. haven't submitted your portfolio, <laughs> do it. Okay, um, story, fun story. Okay, so I didn't have to back out, which was great. Um, I didn't have to let everyone down, and if I wasn't such a uh, social media person uh, who learns and fails in the open as much as possible. Um, nobody would have had to know that I went through this total crisis uh, and challenging mental health thing, which oh, it no. really was, right? Like I was like- You're on the cusp of disgrace. I was, yeah, I was like, <laughs> do I figure out how to do this myself? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do I pay a ton of money for somebody to do it for me at this point um, outside of the people that I know and can tap into that don't have time for it. What do I do? Um, and so 
I wouldn't have had to tell anybody that, but it ended up being really, really good. So I pull it off right at the last minute, buzzer beater, turn in my 40 posters that I made. Um, and the show happens over the course of like a week or so, and I sold two posters. So nothing crazy. I wasn't surprised necessarily because again, I wasn't as proud of that one um, as I would have been with the other one that probably would have sold better and made more money for the charity and all that stuff. But the important part was um, I, it came through. So that was all fine. I was like, whatever. Got an email about a week after the show from a guy saying, hey, um, I know this is random, but I live in New York and my girlfriend and I were visiting Austin last week and we just happened to pop into this this art show. And my girlfriend's a really big fan of your work and we saw your poster there, but I didn't want to travel with it because, you know, we were coming back to New York and I didn't want to damage it, but I'd really love to get this for her for a Christmas present. And so I was just like, totally cool. He's like, so if you have any left when it's done, let me know. And if, you know, if you'll sell me one and ship it, then, you know, I'd love to buy one. I was just like, cool. Like, at least I sold one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it turns out I had plenty left um, and that was fine. So I reached out to the guy. And in one of these interactions over email, he did something he hadn't done before, which is he left his email signature on there. And this guy was a creative director at Sports Illustrated. Oh. So, <laughs> as soon as I saw that, I was just like, wait a second. Silver lining, uh, dang. Okay, so yeah, not only will I send you one, but I'm gonna send you two, and I'm not gonna charge you for them. And um, forgive my uh, super easiness here, but um, obviously I would love to work with Sports Illustrated. That would be a really fun thing for me. So let me know if you ever have a project that you would be interested wow. in working on with me. Um, and then two months later, he hit me up for the Sports Illustrated swimsuit You got issue. the project. So um, what started as a really trying time for my family and <laughs> for... Oh me and everything and just barely scraping by with uh, pulling out what could be a, you know, described as sort of a win from a near catastrophe ended up being the thing that uh, got one of the biggest projects that I've, that I've worked on ever. So um, moral of the story is, you know, show up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> entertain every everything that comes along um, and they may not all be winners but sometimes crazy things can happen so that is amazing squeak 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 you never know where opportunities are going to come from Rachel says it's really it's true so true people are curious about lino cut yeah um, and excited about the idea. It's a great way, long stroke times, <laughs> um, it's a great way to, to make some prints. I mean, um, it's super lo-fi, right? Yep. Like it's, uh, you have to, I don't know, I'm, I was getting ready to say you have to have like some hand skill, but like there's no, no similarity in carving to, <laughs> to drawing, right? Really. So, um, I mean, it's uh, it's all about uh, you know what skills you you have. Sometimes you find out you have a skill for something that you had no idea you did. Like maybe you can't figure out how to get the pencil to do what you want on paper with a with a lettering piece or something. But then you find out, hey, I can actually carve pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe that's like your your way into that. Um, and I just did it really simple too. So like I I got like a big the biggest piece of linoleum I could find because they had to be 18 by 24 inch posters. So that was hard. Um, and the only linoleum I could find, I was looking for like gray linoleum on a, you know, cork background, or like the things you see at the mm -hmm. at the art store all the time. Um, but they weren't anywhere near that size. Right. So I would either had to do like two of them, which was getting really dicey, um, or I found this piece that I ended, ended up getting that was big enough, but it was clear. <gasps> totally clear. But... <laughs> But you could see through it, right? right? So um, once I printed my design properly in reverse, uh, I could put it under there. Um, less helpful than you'd think, because <laughs> it's still like oh. 
you know, an eighth of an inch yeah. thick. So um, there's a little little wonkiness that goes in there. But again, like kind of like the the appeal of using that as a printing technique is that it is a, is very handmade and kind of you know that that lo-fi aspect to it and stuff. And you get like a kind of an unpredictable print out of it too. Right. So it's like every piece is truly unique, which is kind of cool in its own. Um, so I mean, all that came together to to be something pretty cool. But then what I did was I just cut the linoleum to like an inch within the poster dimensions, mm -hmm. 18 by 24, so 17 by 23. And then I did my design kind of like as big as I could do it in that space. And then I just carved out the actual lettering and then just inked the entire thing. So I used a lot of ink, probably more than I needed to. But so the majority of the poster is the print and then like the lettering is actually knocked out cool. of that. So um, it's pretty cool. And there's a, where do I have that? I've got some of the, the process of that on my Instagram and stuff too, if anybody wants to check that out. I'm not sure where that is on my computer, so I'm not going to try and <laughs> find it <laughs> to show you right now, but it's out there in places. I've always thought that the act of carving the linoleum is just so relaxing. and I mean, it probably wasn't relaxing for you <laughs> in that particular yeah, situation. Yeah, the circumstances but on a good day, took the fun out of it. It's very relaxing. Yeah, yeah. I was I was pleased that after literally ever having done that once, um, and also not to great success, I was like, didn't have a ton of high hopes coming into it that <laughs> it was going to be easy or fast or whatever. Um, but I bought the supplies for it that Friday morning, and I had it carved by that night, so it was relatively easy to do. No, that's not true. I, I finished it up the next morning, so I maybe spent five or six hours on the thing. So. I mean, that's not terrible at all. Not at all. I have the poster pulled up if Sweet. Um, everyone wants to see it. Love is the warmest color. That's so sweet. It's, it's definitely so what you mean about all that texture. It's great that it has so much negative space that yeah. you can really see all of that. Yeah, I mean, that's just like, that was the smooth linoleum. So that's not any added texture. That's just how linoleum prints when you want to print it. Because yeah. it's like, it's hard to get it really solidly coated and everything, and I was probably doing that wrong and all that. So, I mean, the result is something that is, you know, a lot of the texture a lot of people go for, you know, kind of just happening naturally, which was a, kind of a cool thing, too. Beautiful. Thanks. There's a photo on there somewhere, too, of, uh, of the actual linoleum that people can check out. Super people fun. love it. I think you're too hard on yourself. <laughs> I, I like the way it turned Are out. Are they still really for cool. sale? Yeah, I got a bunch of them left. Hey. Nobody bought them. <laughs> so let me know. In fact, um, I would love to still donate a mm -hmm. big po portion of those uh, proceeds to that charity. The charity is really cool too. So it was like, it was a music theme um, because the charity was Kids in a New Groove, which is a music based mentoring. Uh, program for underprivileged youth. Yeah. So like, um, you know, kind of giving people mentoring and, and you know, kind of life experience coaching and stuff through making music and stuff, which was awesome. And that is an Alt-J quote for anybody that doesn't <laughs> know. So we are super close to the portfolio oh, review. Coming on down. I'm excited. I get a sneak peek at the portfolios, and you're going to like what you're going to see. I like it. Kata says, howdy from Killeen. Is that a place that you know oh, of? Oh, yeah, sure. It's not too far from Austin. Very close by. They also say, um, Kata says, I can't do lettering. I really suck at it, but watching people like Ryan is absolutely amazing. Hey, I couldn't do it either eight years, nine years ago. We'll say nine years ago. Okay. I was, uh, this is not something that, oh, time's up. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, we're gonna go to space real quick. Be back in a second. The atmosphere is safe to breathe. 
<laughs> Ryan floated away. <laughs> Gravity. <laughs> man. Feels good. Feels good to to breathe. I'll fix the hair. Okay. You look great. Thanks. <laughs> All Camera right. Camera adds ten hairs or something. So we have Miguel Spinola's portfolio here. It's closed. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. We didn't spill. Okay. What appeals to you? I'm gonna let you drive. Oh um, we're gonna spend a few minutes reviewing, clicking through. Totally up your alley. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about this Dreamville thing. I am a big uh, J. Cole and Dreamville fan. Is this the official thing? I wonder. Did you do this for them? You've got a lot of views and some some cloud on Behance. There's a there's a good chance. Um, let me know, Miguel, if that was uh, the actual thing. It looks like their their logo. That's awesome. I love the baseball style look of that too. It's very very cool. Um, and this is cool. So I want to point out something on this 25 here. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, click. I have my trackpad set for tapping to, to activate, and most people don't, I find. Um, okay, so this one, this was really cool because um, he's using this awesome technique that I often like to do too, especially when I'm doing light lettering on a dark background, which is using these little notches and little cuts in the letters to act as a shadow. So just with a simple little notch and trim of a thing here and there, you can get some really awesome dimension from a flat piece. So let's see if I can zoom in, not really. <laughs> okay, um, but you can see like right here in the T where that crosses, it kind of breaks up mm -hmm. that zone there. Same with this guy. I love that. It's really good. Juicy. And so yeah, when that comes back around there, you immediately recognize this as, oh, okay, cool. This goes over and then this comes around behind. So where that would normally just be flat and actually create a very heavy spot in the lettering. Mm -hmm. um, and literally draw the eye to it as like a, a really dark, or in this case, light um, area that feels unbalanced. It kind of breaks that up a little bit too, which is really helpful for legibility and stuff, right? So that's really cool, cool technique to keep in mind if you're trying to do something like this style. Useful when you're doing linoleum cuts too. That's how you would. Yeah. That's exactly how yeah. You there's do some it. of that stuff in that design. I, yeah. I cut some of those in so it would do that for sure. Some cool little business cards and stuff there. I like that logo there. Nada. Simple, effective, very cool. Let's see. Let's see the logo collection. I do a lot of. Uh, oh, he's got some. He's got some banners. Let's see what he's <laughs> got. Okay, there's that one that we liked. Simplified, iconic version. Swag on. He's got some of that stuff there too. Now, the, the funny thing about that trick is that when it's inverted, black on white, it kind of does a different thing. But he did something. Right here, see how the the notch is on the top of that. Same with like right here. Instead of being like a shadow, it then becomes kind of like a highlight. So if you are ever going to do this, if you're doing versions of of a logo type for use in dark backgrounds or light backgrounds, it's really cool to do versions for each if you're going to use this trick because like he's done here he's got that notch on the top now so now it becomes like a white highlight on the top of this thing instead of a shadow um right here we could have done that on the top but <laughs> helps for legibility for sure in that case so good job okay oh i like that a lot museum nice good job miguel i Love wish we it. had more diacriticals that's what those are called right yeah. uh, in accents how much one? There was one on the E. Oh, in that, that museum though, yes. Yeah, for I wish sure. had more in English. All over the place. Yeah, yeah. it had such a such so a flavor fun. to some things. Totally. Especially those little like scoop guy. I don't know what I am recall. I'm not a type designer, by the way, so don't make fun of me. But um <laughs> the little like mini C that oh, yeah. is on the bottom of a lot of them. I don't know what that's yeah. called. But they the French use critical, it a lot. So that's good. Yeah, for sure. Are they? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Cool. I think so. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're nodding yes. Yes, yes that's what they're called. Yeah. I like it's, I guess he pretend, does murals you know? too. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Have you done any mural work? I have. Um, I do just enough murals to be like um, impossibly sore after each one. Oh. Like, so that's how rarely I do them. But um, yeah, I'm usually a, a desk, a desk, a captain of my desk, right? Where mm -hmm. I'm sitting and not doing anything. And then so when I do a mural, I'm very sore for a few days. I don't use those muscles like that. <laughs> I like his tattoo. It's like yeah, a big cool. barcode or something. That's cool. I like this documentation. Yeah, it's great photos too. Do you do your own photography, Miguel, or do you have somebody that you pay to come <laughs> shoot you? 
Very cool. Love the wavy vibiness of that mural. Cool. Me too. Dope. So do we get to view any other portfolios or? Yeah, just, we yeah, can cool. move on. Yeah, Thank see. you so much, Miguel, Good for job, sharing man. this with us. Um, take some courage to put yourself out there for sure. and give him a follow to support Miguel. Okay, Sierra Zerpa, the brand spa right. from Colombia. Okay, so see, look, we've got this this joint right here, little fracture style. This is Ooh. the stuff I'm not good at. <laughs> I do not have these these motions. I, I just haven't spent near the time that it takes oh to get goodness. good at that stuff. But look at that, that's so cool. This... Now, I've got some brushes for you. If you, <laughs> if you haven't uh, been using them already, that are great for this sort of thing, I hear um, from people that are competent at this style, but oh, so good. Look at all the texture in those two. Beautiful. I love the splattering. Mm -hmm. You can see the paper coming through. Now, if you're here, do you do these digitally or, cause I can see some of the, kind of the same texture in some of these strokes. But I mean, it's you've done a great job of making it look very analog too. Yeah, so we've got like the kind of uniform streaks in there, like in the K. But uh, like this one, especially, this looks like it could absolutely have been done mm -hmm. on paper with a, with a parallel pen or something. So cool. Nice. Or maybe they're just built up with actual physical s multiple strokes with a brush pen or something like that. Hmm. It looks kind of like what that's doing there, maybe. So good. That's almost harder okay. than that's harder than doing it in one stroke. Yeah. That's, wow. that's wild. There's some cool 3D stuff. 36 days of type. That's a commitment. I've never mm -hmm. managed to to stick with it. I like the numbers too. Yeah, 36 days of type is like a, a thing that's been going on for a few years now, I guess, mm -hmm. on online. You know, you just kind of do all the letters, all the numbers, and some people kind of commit to a a style for the whole the whole time, and other people do like a totally different thing every every letter, which is a lot more to commit to. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love the color usage yeah. on there too. So cool. I like the presentation, how the trios all, all connect. Yeah, yeah. It's like really kind of a, as a it, as a whole, it does a lot of work too, right? not just the uh, individual letters. I want to see this style on this too. Yeah, it's really a cool style. So again, we're kind of using like the, the darker background and the lettering to create a a dimensional effect, right? Which is really, really tricky to pull off and do right, um, and done really nicely here. And not, and not in a usual way either. Usually you see like little cuts and notches to be shadows and stuff, but this is kind of doing that while also giving it a little bit of like a, a, a little bit of motion too, right? It's got like a swirling yeah. effect to it almost, which is really cool. Good job, love that. I have a question for you. Yes. How do you place the dot over the eye? <laughs> um, depends on the style. Um, so like with that one there, that was kind of like just like a, a nice simple circle tittle as it's mm -hmm. called. I do know that term. Oh. Um, probably because I'm immature, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it depends. So like sometimes uh, if it's um, a very elegant script, mm -hmm. um, sometimes that that tittle will be kind of like aligned with the slant of the letters and be more ovular. Um, sometimes it's more of a dot like that um, where it's just kind of simple and straightforward. Um, sometimes you luck out and some of the other components of the letters around it pre pre present you I can't talk, present you with opportunities for some fun ligatures, right? Um, so for instance, oh, I've got one actually on this piece that we're doing. So we'll look at that in a second because I don't wanna go through the switching feeds and stuff necessarily and my computer's um, off. But I've actually got a fun ligature happening with the dot of an eye. Okay. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So right here, we got with right here. Mm. So I had a, a situation going on here when I was coming up with this this lockup, and that situation was that I had a dot of an eye to do right here, and I also had a T across in the same space. So those were gonna be button heads. So great opportunity to use a ligature to tie those in together and make them do double duty. So cool. Um, yeah, anyway, let's go back to the important yes. thing here, which is the prototypes. <laughs> I totally Less derailed me. that. What do you think? Where should we go? Oh man, uh, we have any more portfolios? I like the use of those I think uh, it's these two. Okay. Yeah, cool. so we can spend a little more time yeah. digging deeper. Let's take a look at the, the logos on this one too, the logo folio okay. two. I know, I'm always, that always entices <laughs> me, that ambiguous yeah. uh, thumbnail. Okay, you had this up a second ago. I love this use of um, illustration and the yeah. counter of this G. Um, this is really, really cool. So the 
the name is Green Caracas. Hmm. Um, I don't know for sure what that means, uh, what the translation is in that. I feel like all I can think of is Maracas. <laughs> um, so I know that's not right, but the green tells me that this is, uh, you know, oh, it says right here, music eco event. So hmm. we've got this, um, this tie-in of like nature and, you know, eco-friendly some kind of thing that, that's going on with this, this event. Um, and they've tied that into the, the concept nicely with this little leaf illustration that's happening in the G um, and the, yeah. the bottom of that double story G as it's called, I do know, yeah. some term. There's something kind of musical about that G mm -hmm. anyway. Oh yeah. yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, it, yeah, it feels a little bit like, um, a little musical too, what is it about? It I don't know. That? I was trying to think like, oh, maybe there's a music note in there that yeah. I'm not seeing too, but I don't think there is. No. Correct me if I'm no, wrong. It's but just the vibe. Yeah, it does feel very, very playful and, and like it's got some some dance to it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, here's another example. Of, she, she's, she? Who are we? Who are they, we, we don't know. They, okay. Um, they've got uh, an interesting eye solution here too. We've got this G that kind of comes over and becomes the, the dot of that eye. Simple, you know, kind of nice flat cut off on the terminal of that too. So it's not doing like an, a typical eye, dot of an eye shape necessarily, but mm -hmm. it's solidifying that as an eye rather than just like a little short L or something, right? Also, it could be kind of creating a smile. I don't know. Could say that. It's a little wink. I could see it. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Again, with the the cutting out to kind of give you that that overlap and that uh, that dimension. Clever a little ambigram type of deal. Okay, let's see. What's our monogram here? Valentino or Valentina, Mejia, and. Isa Guerre. Wow. I did take three years of Spanish. I don't know much, <laughs> but I, I remember the Can very easy to remember <laughs> pronunciation uh, while ugly. Okay, so <laughs> we've got V, M, and I. I see it. Me too. Good, yeah. I didn't see the V at first because I the M jumped right out at me, but yeah, V is there for sure, very clear. Um, yeah, be I get the 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 line down here at the bottom creates that I, and that's that's the only one that's not like immediate. Obviously, you see a T as well in there because of that. But I mean, you know, it's there. It's solved. It's solved for I. <laughs> I like it. Ooh, this one's really cool too. Nexus is that what we're looking at? Yeah, Nexus. Very cool. That's a tricky one to pull off. I like, I like that a lot. So we've got a little bit of symmetry going on here with the way this S kind of like comes from the the inside corner of both that N and that U, which is like solid, solid pull off there. That's pretty wild. That's cool. And it's still readable somehow. Yeah. yeah and then you've got this impressive. kind of like this really nice grid and this plus in the mm -hmm. middle here where everything kind of converges and whew, that's cool. I like that a lot. Nice simple C O, right? I don't see any of those letters involved in what the name says. Opus but. Task. Oh, there is. I keep knocking it there. Very clear and, and legible um, <laughs> labeling. And this is cool too. We've got some, uh, maybe some transparency or at least mm. some some gray work to kind of create some of that dimension too. Um, and a very non-standard uh, unique G, which I always like to see. It's um, There's a lot of ways you can be very obvious with something, right? And then doing something that's a little less of an obvious solution is always always nice to see. I really like this this style here. Casual. Yeah, very casual, and the, a lot of the thing that plays into that casualness of it um, is the the bounciness of that bass line, right? So um, if you're doing something that's really neat and tidy, you're going to want those those things to kind of rest really neatly on a nice consistent bass line. Uh, but if you want to add a little bit more playfulness to it and a little bit more of that casual vibe for whatever it is that you're doing, um, this one, for instance, looks like it's a recipe book, which is kind of like you maybe want this to be like maybe the the chef's signature, the way mm -hmm. they would write this this name of this book um, on there. So it gives it very much of that handmade, imperfect feel as far as the, the baseline goes, um, while being very, very fluid and, and playful as well. This style that's like very close to um, a monolinear style where everything is really low contrast and kind of universal weight, um, is really hard to pull off because what a lot of people don't realize is that to do that well, you do have to have some contrast in there. This really looks like it's all kind of the same weight, but there's a lot of little areas like in these little connecting strokes and stuff where they do get a little bit smaller because if they didn't, it would create a really heavy, heavy area that looks 
too dark, or too heavy in those spots. And so you got to thin it out and add a little bit of contrast to pull that off. And it's really hard to do, um, to do to good effect, at least for sure. And this is this is doing it. I like it. It's in the details, I guess. Yeah. I like that one, too. Yeah. Very it's cool. a fun Very S. modern calligraphy style. Yeah. Sweet. Great. Good job, guys. Thank you for sharing, Ciro Zerpa. Oh, so cool. Yeah. Ciro. I like that name. Thank oh, okay. So that, that is their logo on that, oh. that third one. Cool. I didn't I didn't Great. see it in the in the Me icon neither. up there first, but we awesome. were too mesmerized by the yeah. black letter. So cool. Yeah, that Great. one was really uh really eye catching for sure. Should we dive back into your project? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm gonna be so far from done on this thing today because I am, I love to talk, but yeah. <laughs> That's all right. We enjoy a little a little homework. That's the cool thing about doing something that you literally just love is that uh, when you gotta spend a little more time on it after the fact, it's not it's not bad. It's not the end of the world. So I'll come back in here. Do, do, do. Oh, there we go, now we're drawn. Reconnect. So this is your opportunity to ask uh, Ryan any last minute questions yeah. in the chat. Let's get in. Um, one thing that I should mention is that this week we have um, the daily creative challenge happening. So tomorrow will be the first challenge. Um, you can tune in with Jesus tomorrow morning um, and follow along with him and brush up on your Photoshop skills. Sweet. So I also on the plane yesterday was um, when I was in there in fresco creating the background, I started to paint the letters with some white uh, oil paint brush. Dude, it's so cool. And I didn't save any of it apparently because I <laughs> didn't didn't do the right thing probably. I probably had to put my iPad away in a rush, but uh, I also didn't get very far anyway, so that's whatever. But ugh, man, the effect, I cannot wait till that is like fully out and integrated into the, the rest of the the product lineup and stuff, it's gonna be so incredible what people create with it. I haven't uh, done a proper dive into it myself, but I'm excited to. It's so, it's like almost overwhelming. Like mm -hmm. you have, anytime you get um, access to something incredible and new, it's like you have this paralysis of right. <laughs> all the options of things you could do with this thing. It's just like, I don't even know where to start. This is amazing. That's kind of how I've been with it so far. Is just like I find myself in there just like doodling because I'm just like, oh, whoa! <laughs> look at that thing. Look at the texture in this. And oh my god, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. But I'm like, I'm just killing a whole day just playing because it's so incredible. I uh, I was fortunate to have a demo of it yesterday, um, and apparently there's gonna be a learn tab inside the app. Oh, cool. Um, so that if you are feeling a little bit paralyzed, you have somewhere <laughs> to start. Yeah, do a few tutorials, right? Like that's um, that's one of my favorite things that Adobe's been doing in in recent years. It seems like I mean I know there's always been tutorials around, but um, they've been presenting themselves so much more. Uh, readily in the apps themselves and stuff, which is like, is, is great. Cause I think a lot of people don't realize that all that stuff is out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and these things too, the fact that these Adobe Lives just live in perpetuity online. Um, I was uh, sending my, my newsletter out this weekend and it just occurred to me that I could link to the, the three hour and a half long episodes from yeah. last year when I was here and, um, and let everybody see those because they were all just there. Definitely go back and watch those. It's just, they're chock full of delicious information. Um, let's see. Do you need to know drawing to learn hand lettering? Thanks for the question, Monir. That is a really good question. And it, I think it's something that um, people don't really think about a lot. I mean, um, I think what I was starting to say before we went to the portfolio thing is like, when I first started doing this, it wasn't like I stumbled across something that I was just naturally good at. Mm -hmm. Far from it. <laughs> like I first started, I was just like, I know how to drive right in cursive. I could do this, right? Like, <laughs> how hard could it be? It's very, very far from that. Um, knowing what cursive letters are is just like table stakes, right? Like mm -hmm. you've got to, you got to learn how to make them. Um, and I was, it was very rough at first and not good, but I had an amazing blast of a time doing it. Um, and so I just decided, okay, this sucks, but I see what these other people are doing and I wanna be able to do that. So I just kind of decided that's what I was gonna spend my life on. Um, but 
biggest part of that though for me was just getting back into drawing and sketching. Um, I had been trying to learn web design, right? And I, mm -hmm. um, the thing that made me decide to become a designer was actually designing an app. Um, with the help of a developer partner, I we made a Twitter app for BlackBerry, which I was using heavily at the time because that was a thing you did in 2011 sometimes. <laughs> um, and we made this app and it was like, I think maybe still lives as like the best selling Twitter app for, for BlackBerry, which doesn't translate to much money wise because it's BlackBerry, but um, it was fun and it kind of gave me this taste of design and I was just like totally hooked. Um, but everything I was doing was all digital, all the time. Design, writing, whatever, like any work I was doing was so far removed from drawing for 10 years. So I was so rusty and a big part of the early learning process was just even figuring out how to get my hand to do what my head wanted it to again, right? And so while I think the question was like, do you have, you know, do you have to know how to draw? Um, I am a firm believer that drawing is a thing that regardless of how capable you think you are at it, it is absolutely a practice thing that you can get very rusty at and also get good at if you think you have, like have no drawing bone in your body. I guarantee you that <laughs> with enough practice, you can figure out how to um, get your hands to work <laughs> the way that your mind thinks that they should be, even if you don't think that they can. Um, and you just, you know, that is a big part of it is being able to move a pencil in such a fashion that it does what you want to. Yeah. Um, and a big obstacle at first, but super, super learnable. I found that I stopped drawing when I started going to design school. Um, and I, I don't draw that much now. I hardly at all really. And so I'm curious if you had any exercises that you would do or how did you overcome that frustration with being knowing what you want and not being able to execute it? Or do you have any, or is it just to do it? Yeah, that's yeah. A, such a big part of it is just the repetition, right? Yeah. I mean, like um, doing it and not being happy with it um, enough times, you start to reveal to yourself the things that are specifically what you're not happy about mm -hmm. with that, right? Um, and that goes for anything, not just lettering. I mean, obviously, um, a big part of it is taste. So right. just kind of knowing what's good, um, even if you can't do it, is a big first step in being able to get there so that you can kind of study what you see as being, okay, that is clearly good. I like this, that's awesome. Um, mine is very different. Uh, what's different and how do I get from here to there? Um, and just kind of being able to see what's good and, and seeing what is important to learn from mm -hmm. is a big part of it. So, you know, you can't, I don't know, I guess you could learn taste too. I think um, having having good aesthetic uh, taste is, is important, but um, in a lot of ways you can learn what is respected and regarded as good by research and studying things. Um, so that can be part of it too. But I mean, I think that being able to clearly see those differences is the first step and then you know kind of like slowly and methodically focusing on one thing at a time that you see is clearly different from yours now and where you want to be um, and then kind of specifically focusing your practice on fixing that thing um, you know there's that 10,000 hours uh, Malcolm Gladwell thing where mm -hmm. you know 10,000 hours spent on anything, you become an expert. But I gotta tell you, if you spend 10,000 hours lettering the way that you are right now mm -hmm. as a beginner, you're gonna get really good at doing a really mediocre letter. <laughs> yeah. You have to be deliberate about what it is you're repeating. And really um, a lot of that comes from having that, that taste to see your work now as not good enough and different from the thing that you want it to be. and figuring out piece by piece what it is that's going to close that gap for you. That is such good advice. And it's hard to be vulnerable, even if it's just to your own self, but um, the sooner you start, you know, thickening that skin, the better. Cause you're, I mean, once you start doing, once you are good and you start doing client work, that's going to be your daily reality anyway. So yeah, yeah. it's part of the process. For sure. 
It's just us. Uh, oh. <laughs> We're wrapping up now. Um, oh. So let's look at the schedule again. Uh, we have some great stuff coming up. Ryan will be back hosting again. Okay. Um, we will be working on the Adobe XD Creative Challenge later today. <laughs> Do it again. Um, and then finally wrapping up with uh, design systems with Hannah Jang. And don't forget about the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge that'll be happening all week with Jesus. I'm so excited about the XD stuff. Um, I just talk about segues. This is totally natural and like not even not even a big deal. Um, but okay, we gotta wrap. <laughs> Bye. So I'll Thanks see you for in a little bit. With us. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, guys.